At the end of the year, there was these series of Esther. And um, that was in the fall of this past year. And I had went through each of those lessons, which was over an hour long. So today I've kind of meshed this lesson that we have here with um, what Brother Cisco taught because it was so, so good. It was so enlightening. And I had never heard the book of Esther taught the way that he taught it. So um, we're going to get into this today. But one of the questions in the lesson at the beginning um, said this, I want you to think, if you were queen for a day, if you were queen or king, okay, the guys most powerful person in the world, Erica would pay her house off. You could buy a whole big mansion. You could, you could, she doesn't want a mansion. What would you, anybody else, what would you do if you were queen for a day or king? I'm hearing a lot of talk amongst everybody. Pay, pay, Erica's going to pay her house off and maybe the whole church's house is off. There we go. All right. So you could do a lot of great things, right? If you were queen or king for a day. So we're going to start with, um, I'm not going to go read all the scriptures through the book of Esther. Um, but we're just going to kind of start in the middle here, and it's about Mordecai's um, request for Esther's help, because I think we're all really familiar with this book. And I'm going to start in um, chapter 4, verse 4. She, she sent clothing to him to replace the sackcloth. You know, Mordecai had learned that there was this um, plot against the Jewish people, that they were going to be destroyed. Esther's already in the palace at this point in the scripture. And Mordecai is so troubled. He's mourning outside the gate. He's wailing and crying. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the square in the front of the palace gate. Mordecai told him the whole story and how much money that Haman had promised to pay the royal treasury for the destruction of the, of the Jews. Mordecai gave Hathak, who was, um, who was a chamberlain for um, Esther, a copy of the decree issued in Susa, and it called for the death of the Jews. And he asked, he, he, Hathak um, had to explain this to Esther and urge her to go in before And um, gave the message that Mordecai said. Okay, here, something's got to be done about this. Mordecai sent back this reply to Esther because Esther's like, you know what? You, you know that you can't just come before the king. He has to call you. I mean, that could result in death. He has to, you, you can't just walk in there like you own the place. And the king's not called for me to come in more than a month. So he gave this message to Esther, and Mordecai sent back this message. Don't think for a moment that you will escape there in, there in the palace. Don't think that you're just safe because you're there and we're all out here. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. What's more, who can say that you have been elevated to the palace for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink anything for three days or nights. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. And if I'm going to die, then I'm willing to die. So Mordecai went away and Esther did as she told him. And so, from the lesson today, we'll see how God often works out his will through adverse circumstances, and through faith, with God's help, we can, we can really make it through anything, anything. So, this morning in the lesson connection, it's about a um, young boy from Ukraine named Misha that has Down syndrome. He doesn't communicate verbally, and in 2022, of course, we all know what happened in Ukraine, Misha and his families faced extremely 
um, intense challenge when the Russian armies came in and destroyed their home, and things worsen, worsened for their family, and they had to flee. So Misha's mother knew that this was a difficult situation. She had to convince what was familiar for her son that he had to leave that. Searching for a solution, Misha's mother told her son that he would be traveling through Europe to meet this hero of his who was a professional actor and wrestler named John Cena. So the possibility of him encountering his hero calmed him, and it made this trip much easier. Like any good mother, she simply tried to make a bad situation just a little bit better. So Cena heard of this, and he flew to Amsterdam to meet Misha's family. Cena talked with Misha. He brought him gifts. He took pictures with him and making this, this situation just a little bit better. Like Misha and his family, Esther and Mordecai faced adverse circumstances that called them to demonstrate courageous faith. The jealousy of Haman trying to crush Mordecai, eradicate the Jewish people, and Haman sought permission for the king's destruction to do this. God worked behind the scenes, positioning Esther inside of this whole mess that was taking place. So the Lord has a strategy, and it often works out very differently than we might think. The Lord often chooses to use us, and he puts us in the right place at the right time. And even though we believe in God and have tremendous faith, we must push to recognize that the Lord puts us in situations. Sometimes it seems very difficult to be the difference makers to make a positive change, to do his will. So as we're looking at the book of Esther today, we find there's no mention of a temple. There's no mention of priests, sacrificers, sac sacrifices. There's only a king and a queen and a palace. And the king and the queen work together to deliver the people of God. There's no return to Israel, which is different than the other moves of God that we see in the Old Testament. It's... In the Old Testament, when we look at the rest of it, it's always um, restoration of the temple and, and coming back to Israel, but not here because they're representing the church in the last days in the book of Esther. And I think that this is how we can draw a parallel and connect to the book of Esther today because we are the church of the last days. The story of Esther takes place in the Persian Empire, and the Jews in this time were treated favorably. So, however, we see the Jews, they're facing a great genocide, and I think that that's no different than kind of what we're seeing in the news today with all this craziness that's going on. After defeating the Babylonians, becoming a superpower of the day, the Persians allowed the Jews to go back to their homeland. The decree of Cyrus the Great reversed the exile and the 70 years in captivity. That The Jews were allowed to rebuild their temple but many of the Jews remained in this country, in the Persian Empire. So the Jews at the beginning of Esther were treated in a positive way under the Persian Empire. So it seems surprising that all of the sudden, it seems like out of nowhere, all of the sudden, this decree comes to eradicate a whole race of people off the face of the planet. And we see how fast things can change, even with, you know, COVID, how fast the world can shut down and things can become crazy and um, the attitudes of people, it's just, it happens so fast. So King Xerxes ruled over the Persian Empire and from what we read, this guy really liked to party. He liked to live it up. He was an arrogant man. He was demanding. He was unreasonable, and I would say even, probably to some extent, he treated women with disrespect from what we read about Vashti as queen. And Queen Vashti seems to have gotten the worst of it. We find in the text that the king was throwing yet another party to show off all his great wealth, and then demanded that Vashti appear before him and the men attending his party. He wanted to parade her through everybody. And she totally refused. And, you know, as a woman, that's kind of creepy. I mean, to be paraded in front of a bunch of men. No wonder she said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. 
she took a stand, and it ticked off the king. And the king's advisors seemed a little bit shocked and actually even disgusted um, with Queen Vashti. And they convinced the king that he better do something about this queen with a bad attitude because all the rest of the people in the entire kingdom is going to hear about this. And then they're going to rebel, and they're going to have this just crazy worldwide rebellion of women because of Queen Vashti. So she paid the price for the king's bad behavior. After the king's anger had cooled, the servants went out then. He had started to miss her. And, you know, the Bible says she was very beautiful, and he began to miss her. And the king's advisor was like, no, 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 no. We're going we're gonna to set you up with something way better than her. So they went out into the kingdom to find the most beautiful virgins and bring them back to maybe one could be his new queen. And Esther found herself among the chosen. The Bible says she was very beautiful. And, of course, her uncle, I know some stuff you read, it talks about Mordecai being her cousin. Today I'm going to refer to him as her uncle. Her uncle Mordecai told her not to reveal that she was a Jew. When she was taken to the palace, he said, Esther, don't tell anybody. Keep it a secret that you are a Jew. And Esther was on a secret mission from God inside of that palace. She just didn't realize it at the time. So Esther followed Mordecai's advice. She found favor with this crazy king and, um, and the king's chamberlain, Haggai, the keeper of the women, the keeper of the women. So we see God still at work in difficult situations. Esther faced the tough reality of being taken from her home. Imagine this. She's taken from her home. She's forced to keep her identity a secret. She's placed in a competition of women from all over the empire. I don't know what would be worse, being taken from your home or placed in a beauty pageant with a bunch of women. For real. We know how mean and nasty women can get, right? So despite Esther having to face difficult situations, we see that God is working his faithfulness. Though the king seemed difficult, Esther found favor with the king. She found favor. And of course, now she's in this place where she is, she is at the top. She has the finest clothes. She has the finest jewelry. She has spa treatment. I mean, she probably gets her feet massaged every morning, has a back massage before she goes to bed. I don't know. You know, just think, the, whatever you want, the best of it all. So now it seems maybe life is pretty good for Esther. Esther's the queen. She's gotten used to this palace life and the best of everything. Plus, she is the favorite. She's the favorite. How many of you guys, uh, my dad... My dad would admit this. My dad says, I do have a favorite, and I'll admit it. You are my favorite, and I always like to be the favorite. And I ask my grandma. I always say, Grandma, you got favorites, don't you? And she said, I don't have favorites, Nicole. There's just some personalities that I like better than others. (laughs) And I like that. As I get older, I realize what my grandma was meaning. Yeah, okay, there's just some personalities we like better. But what's, what's there to complain about? Then all of a sudden for Esther, this trouble creeps in out of nowhere when life is good. I overcame all of this stuff, being, you know, I'm an orphan, and then I'm raised by my uncle, and then um, I'm, I'm at, you know, a young age, I'm taken into this palace, and I'm scared, but that all of a sudden things are good. And, I mean, I was afraid at first, but now, now this, I mean, I didn't ask for this. We see this wicked Haman coming onto the scene as he sees an opportunity to capitalize on his status and on his relationship with the king and take down an enemy that he had his eyes on. Haman not only wanted to kill Mordecai, he hated Mordecai, but he hated all the Jews too. He wanted to take them all out. And the Bible describes Haman's background as a a guy, a guy. 1 Samuel 15 tells a story of Saul, the Benjamite king, and he's told to destroy all of the Amalekites, including King Agag. And Saul did not completely obey God's instructions. And his lack of obedience led to the current problem that the Jews were facing. Just think, 
Just like King Saul not obeying the complete will of God, the God's instructions caused problems later for his relatives. Just like if we don't obey the will of God now, what kind of future problems do we set our family up for? The mess came when Mordecai, he refused to bow to Haman, said, I'm not going to bow to Haman. So Haman thought, you know what? I'm just going to wipe Mordecai out. I'm going to wipe out the entire race of people. Haman was able to get the okay from a fickle king to destroy all the Jews. And, you know, as we, as we look at this and we have seen the news the past several months, you, I, one word that just comes to mind when you turn on the news and you see all of that and you hear everything that's going on, it's hate. Hate. Such an extreme hatred. And we see that this lines up to this hour, that Haman gets his power through, and I love this, this is what Brother Cisco said, Haman gets his power through tolerance, though he himself is intolerant. And we see that that antichrist spirit in, in the world today is at work with this. All this preaching about tolerant, be tolerant, be tolerant. At the same time, they themselves are intolerant. They're intolerant. And then the very, I mean, you can't hardly turn on YouTube preaching without some crazy video coming up with witchcraft in it or, man, you just want to watch something about how to fix up a house and you got commercials about drag queens. I mean, crazy stuff. You're like, all I want to do is listen to my Christian music or watch about building a house or, you know, and you're just, all this stuff's coming at you. And the very basics of morality, family, marriage, what God set up from the beginning is being destroyed by the enemy and it's done through tolerance it's done through apathy. We get used to seeing it. Oh, well. And through compromise. Haman had an agenda, and it's no different in this world today that we live in. There is an agenda. Haman went to the king, and he painted this horrible picture of this bad, ugly guy and the Jews. And, and you know, you better do something about these people. I mean, they're really, really bad. They may just overthrow your kingdom. He offered to pay the king to take care of the problem that threatened King Xerxes' kingdom, though this really was a lie. You see, Haman had no power of his own. He only had the authority that the king granted him. And this shows us the devil needs permission. The enemy wants you to have this perception or this belief that he can do whatever he wants to you. But this is a lie. I remember after the whole transplant thing, and I was laying in bed, and the Lord spoke very specifically to me. In fact, um, I didn't remember this, but Sister Kathy Bowling had reminded me before I got real sick. She said, you know, it was the weirdest thing. You had us pray for your family. She said, you had us pray for your family, for protection over your family, and you were concerned, and I said, man, I sure don't remember that. And she said, well, you did. And the Lord spoke to me. I was laying in bed, and it was after that whole mess, and I finally get the lungs. Everything's good. And the Lord said to me, I want you to know that the enemy sought to destroy you and your entire family, but I have spared them. And, and it just goes to show that the enemy, yes, I mean, if he could take all of us out, he would have already done it. But the Lord has his hand upon us, and he's faithful. He's faithful. And he has to have permission. He has to have permission. What we know and what we believe, our perception affects our lives in loss or in victory. It really does. What we believe matters. Esther soon discovered the problem that she and her fellow Jews faced. Although, more, although Esther was in royal robes, she's dressed in the finest and the best. Mordecai is wearing sackcloth. Esther's in a safe place within the palace. Mordecai is outside the king's gates, and he's crying and wailing because we have got a problem. Esther, she's like, oh, my goodness, what is the big deal here? Esther tried to send her uncle some clothes and say, here, just put these on. But he refused, and he gave Esther a wake-up call. Hey, princess, hey, queen, 
you think that you're safe in this palace. You think that you can escape. But maybe you were just put in this palace for another reason. Not to save yourself, but to save your people, to save God's people, to do the will of God. Esther had to trust God, though. Just think as a child, she's lost her parents. She's faced vulnerability. She's faced being scared, fearful, pain, tragedy in her life. She's raised by her uncle as a young girl. She's taken out of her home probably around the age of 16 to the king's palace. And just think, this young 16-year-old girl being taken out of her home. And then she probably heard what had happened to Vashti. That, wow, off with her head. Yeah, I don't know if she was killed or not. But, you know, she was banished or whatever happened to her. And hearing about this king and and how fickle he is and how angry he gets sometimes, Mordecai raised Esther, whose name was Hadassah, which means myrtle tree. And it seemed like Esther was just stuck right there where she's planted and she's unable to move and and she had this horrible past. But but Mordecai is saying to her, no, Esther, No, Esther, God has a plan for you. He has a great purpose. He has a great destiny for you. Where you've suffered, you've been a victim before, you've had loss, God is going to make you an overcomer, not only you, but his people an overcomer through you, through your ministry. Your name is Esther, and you are a star. You're a star. You're no longer an orphan. You're adopted. You're loved. You have a new identity. And this is the power of God at work in our lives through the word of God, through the gospel, is that God takes our past. He takes those things that we thought would ruin us or ruin our families or shatter us, completely take us out, and he turns that into something beautiful. He turns that into a testimony. Nothing, nothing that God ever allows us to go through is ever, ever wasted. Ever wasted. He works all things together for our good, the Bible tells us. And the Lord carefully, he's so careful with us. He weighs every single little thing that he allows in our lives. What Esther went through as a child, this pain, this difficulty in her life accelerated her growth. We become bitter or better, really. It's our choice. We can regress, we can go backwards, or we can overcome. Am I going to find fault with God? Am I going to find fault with his church? Am I not going to trust people because I was hurt before? Or am I going to get over the things in my past and allow God to heal me and be used for his glory? What what am I, what it's my choice, what do I choose? So Esther had this perception that she was completely powerless. She was afraid to go into the king. I mean, he hadn't even called her in 30 days. I mean, he must not care for her anymore, right? Maybe he's found somebody new. Maybe he's angry with her. Esther was fooling herself. The truth is, she had more power than Haman. She was She was one of the most powerful people in the kingdom. And many times as the church, we believe that same lie thinking, what what can I really do? What can I do? Who am I? I'm a nobody. I'm an orphan. I'm a victim. But the truth is, the church, the church is the most powerful force on the planet. I love that. I love that. The church is the most powerful force on the planet. It says in Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 19, then Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, and he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church And the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you forbid on earth or bind on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit or you loose on earth will be permitted in heaven. 
And we find just like Peter, who's called a rock, that what we believe matters. Revelation does matter, and it can release power. And we find that being part, what does it say? The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, right? It's being part of the church. It does matter. We're not out there on our own, but we're part of a body of believers. And the Lord will keep us safe. The Lord will do great things through the church. So by grace, we come boldly before the throne. What does Hebrews chapter 4 say? This high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he faced all the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly, it says, to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us in the time where we most need it. So knowing who you are is vital. Knowing your purpose is vital. Just a little example I thought about when I was studying if let's say me or any other healthcare providers in here, if somebody's having a health crisis in here and they need help, and I sit back in my chair and I say, "Well, <laughs> I don't know if I'm good enough," and you know, I'm not a doctor. I didn't go to school to be. Where's the doctor at? I'm not a doctor, and uh, I I don't know. I don't know about this. Blood, no, that's nasty. No, you get up and you help. You you may not know exactly what's going on, but you get up and you respond because you know that, hey, this is what I am. This is this is the ministry God gave me, and I, I'm able to do this, and I need to get up, and I need to act on this. It's important to know your purpose because someone's life matters. The lives in this church matter. The lives in our community matter. It does matter. If you don't know your purpose, I you need to pray about that and ask God to help you. The Lord's already showed me my purpose later in life. I was concerned about that. Lord, I can't, you know, with my health and all the things that I've went through, realistically, I can't work as a nurse in the job that I want to do now for, you know, the rest of my life. What what is my purpose? What is my calling? What's what's the destiny that you have for my life? I encourage you to pray for that and the Lord will show you that. He'll show you, and it'll encourage you, and it'll strengthen you. So now that I know, Esther's like, now that I know my purpose, I have to do something about it because revelation produces responsibility. Are we the church called by his name or what? It's crazy because Esther was extremely hesitant to go into the king. Mordecai gave her this pep talk then, and then she said, well, if I'm going to die, then I'm just going to die. But this girl, Esther, she had faith and she was smart. She already had a banquet prepared before she went into the king. She had already prayed and she had already fasted and prepared before she went into the king. This girl was ready. She was ready. She had done all the preparation. And from what scripture tells us, the king was totally crazy about her. He was crazy about her. I mean, she thought she was going to die. She comes in and, and into the throne room, and he immediately tells her, Oh, Esther, my beautiful, perfect queen, Esther, up to half the kingdom, I'll give you. She didn't even have to say a word. Just half the kingdom, I'll give you, Esther. I love you so much. Wondering if she's going to die to being given half the kingdom. And just as God's church He has resources available to us. And when we step out of fear and into faith and realize that we are his church, we're called by his name, those resources begin to open up to us. He sets us in, what's the Bible say? Heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 2. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly, in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. And this refers, this equates when you're reading it to being the VIP at a banquet sitting at the president's table. Whatever president you want to put in your mind. But being at the president's table at the banquet. I mean, everybody's looking around like, wow, who's that? Who's that sitting next to, I wonder what they, what they are, what they do sitting next to the president. Esther demonstrated wisdom in preparing two feasts. 
while Haman proved himself foolish. It seemed like he had it all figured out, right? He didn't know about the cross, though. The Bible says the enemy didn't know about the cross. And the enemy is still in the dark about God's church, God's plans. It says, it says he makes, he makes, the Lord makes his wisdom um, to principalities known through the church, through the church. Ephesians chapter 3, God's purpose in all this was to use the church, that's us, to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. We are operating on a high level as a church. I love that. I love that. A high level as a church. You know, we have to know, we have to understand. I go to the doctor, and this is what they say. They say, okay. After five years, you only have a 50% chance to live. Be careful. Okay, I'm at the 10-year mark. You only have a 25% chance to live, okay? You don't get this vaccination, you may die. Like, I'm, I'm serious. And so they, they're telling you all these things and all these statistics. And I have, to, I have to listen. I have to, you know, I have to go to my doctor's appointments and all that. I'm not saying that. But then I have to say, wait a minute. Wait a minute, I'm on a different level here. I'm not going by the statistics. I should have died. I had a 1% to 2% chance. I, I should be gone by now. No, no, no. I, I'm going to live, I'm going to operate in the dimension, in the realm of faith. Of faith, because if I don't, I may die before my time. And I'm not going to do that. We are operating in heavenly wisdom, and it is hidden to the enemy. So we see the beginning of Haman's downfall when the king could not sleep. So the king gets out of bed, we know, and he has the royal records read to him. And um, the, you know, it comes across that Mordecai saved your life. And the king's like, oh, wow, Mordecai saved my life? Well, what did I reward him with? And uh, the servant says, well, um, nothing. I don't, nothing. Nothing was done for him, nothing at all. And the king's like, no way, I didn't reward him. So the king asked for Haman to come in. And Haman at this point didn't know what was going on. And um, the king said, you know what, Haman, if I want to honor somebody, um, what would you recommend? And Haman, so presumptuous and proud and arrogant, thought he, the king was talking about him. And he says, well, you know, this is what I would do. This is how I would honor someone. So the king says, you know what, Haman? terrific idea. I want you to take Mordecai, and I want you to do just as you said. And Haman's like, what? I, uh, oh, okay. And so Haman has to take Mordecai and parade him down on the street on the horses, on the king's horse, and with the royal king robe on, or Mordecai, and he has to announce, Mordecai is so wonderful, basically. Mordecai is so wonderful. This is the king's honoring Mordecai. He's so wonderful. And just think, Haman, how much hate and disgust. And even more after he sees Mordecai rewarded like this. Mordecai, you know, just think, he, he did this great deed and he had to wait all this time for a reward. It's like he saved the king's life and he's probably thinking at that time, well, What's going on here? I did, I did something great. But as we see in this situation, the Lord held as a reward for just the right time according to his will. His will in his purpose. So Hebrews eleven six 6 says, And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Make no mistake. God doesn't forget. And he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You may not get rewarded at that moment, but make no mistake, God has a reward for you. I heard Brother Cisco say this. He said Christians all over the world right now are being martyred. He said more, and he said it in a way I hadn't heard it before. He said more Christians ever than all in history combined in this day and in this hour in which we live. And it seems he said it's just not on the news. And it, and it seems hard to believe because like Esther here in America, 
This is like a palace. Oh, we've got nice cars, and we live in nice homes, and we have nice things, and we don't go hungry. And if, if anybody was going hungry, the church or somebody in the community would chip in and help you. I mean, we, we live in like a palace. But we've got to realize that we are here to reverse the works of the enemy. And there is power inside the church to see deliverance, to see the chains of bondage, addiction broken in our communities, to see families put back together, to stop child abuse, to see those children healed. And, and together as a church, when we realize when we realize that we have this power and this ability through God, it releases power in the community to see great things happen for God's kingdom. Great things happen for his kingdom. We say, you know, there's so many things, though, that need to be done. I mean, there's so much craziness. How can it even happen? But just think, just like we read in the book of Esther, Haman was brought down in one day. One day. It didn't take months or years, but Haman was brought down in one day. And I'm convinced that God will do a quick work even in these last days. And he will miraculously heal people where they would, they would need years, a hundred years of counseling. But God can miraculously heal them in one instant and restore them. The fact is the enemy is afraid of the anointing. He's afraid of our destiny of us being united in operating in the power of the Holy Ghost. When we see a sequent banquet, the plot of Haman is exposed. When Haman tried to plead then with the, you know, he's exposed. He, the, Esther's like, this is what's going on. He told, she told her king, this is what's going on. Haman is wanting to destroy me and my entire race of people. And Haman then begins to plead with the, with the queen. And she turned her head, the Bible says, she wouldn't even give him the time of day because we do not negotiate with the enemy. We don't. And what Haman meant for destruction of the Jews was used for his own destruction. We've got to take back what the enemy has taken. We've got to say, you know what? You're not getting my kid. You're not getting my marriage. You're not, you're not getting the people in this community. We are going to reverse the works of the enemy. We're going to take strongholds down in Jesus' name together as a church. Not just one on our own, but together as a church. So at the end here, as I'm summing up everything and this internalizing the message here, I kind of put my own, I, I took and I put my own stuff here because I, this is what really spoke to me. Sometimes you think that, you know, like, what can I do? Or I, I feel too stupid. I mean, that I've done things before, and I thought, you're such a weirdo. You are so crazy. You're so dumb. Why would you even do that? I, I remember after transplant, okay, um, they sent this doctor in, and uh, one doctor to sit on the edge of my bed, and the other team surrounded him. So it was like 10 guys with white coats around my bed. And the one that sat on the edge of the bed got so close I could see the razor burn on his neck. And basically, he said, your situation's impossible. He said it in a very professional way, of course. But your situation's impossible, and you've extended too much time here. And we need to take our life-sustaining machines and give them to somebody who has a chance, okay? So it's time for you, like, take yourself off this so you can die and we can get to another patient. So, and I had good people taking care of me, but that is what the facts showed, for real. It did, okay, medically. But God's a miracle worker. So anyway, um, I, I have these pictures because my husband thought I was going to die, so he took a few pictures. And um, I don't mean that bad, okay? But it's like, I'm, I'm glad he did now because I look at him like, wow, oh my goodness, I'm like half dead and look at what God's done. And I'm like, oh, blood coming out of my neck and it's coming out of my ears and stuff, okay? And that was the day I was going to die and my bed's tipped up to let the blood run down because I can't stop the bleeding. And so I make this Christmas card with bloody mess, and I put on there um, with the bloody mess, and then another picture with, oh, I'm wearing my Christmas tree with my family, and my daughter has a shirt on that says, let your light shine. And I send this Christmas card with those two pictures, and I put, God is a miracle worker. One, per one to two percent chance for life, God still works miracles. And I sent that Christmas card out to some people in the church, but to all of the doctors, like the whole team, all of them. I was like, 
here's Christmas card for this, and I had their names on all of it, listed, okay, this doctor, this doctor, this doctor, sent it all out. And then later I'm thinking, oh my goodness, how bold. They're probably thinking, we helped save her life. I mean, and she's got a lot of nerve. God does a miracle. I mean, we were there in the operating room with your blood squirting all over us, and God did a miracle. Okay, my hands were in that too. So anyway, I send all that, and um, that doctor that had sat on the edge of my bed, um, I, of course, he got one of the Christmas cards too. He was the number one uh, for it. But anyway, um, I sent the Christmas card a year after transplant. And then the following year, so two years after transplant, I seen this doctor in the elevator at the hospital. And um, he recognized me after a few years, and he said, oh, wow, you look amazing. He said, I, I remember you. I remember your situation and stuff. And he said, uh, you know what, I really, I'm really glad you're doing good. I really am. And I had heard from um, some of the other workers, because I have to go for all these things there, that he's a Jewish man. And he said, I'm, I'm really glad you're doing well. We got off the elevator, and I walked this way, and he started walking this way. And he turned around, and he said, hey. I said, yeah. He said, I've still got your Christmas card. That touched my heart because I thought, I am so stupid, or I am so crazy, or whatever. But I really felt led to do that. I really felt led to send out those cards and announce how awesome God was. You know, and, and sometimes I don't completely understand why God allows bad things to happen or how it's all going to work out. And sometimes people do get hurt, and sometimes people do die. That's the truth. And, and I want to end with this, this right here. Um, it's so important to be sensitive to the moving of God's spirit and where God wants you at a certain place in a certain time. Because five years after my transplant, I'm a nurse and I'm in the hospital. And I'm miles away from where I got my transplant. And an individual comes in as a patient. And he says, you look awful familiar. And I'm getting him ready, asking him questions for surgery. He says, you look awful familiar. I don't know who you are. I've never met you in my life. You know, guys say that sometimes to girls. Oh, you look so familiar. Like, okay, whatever. Um, but anyway, um, he was talking and stuff and asking. He said, that's how I know you. That's how. After, you know, about 30 minutes, I said, what? And he said, you're that girl. You're that girl with the, the ECMO coming out of her heart. And I watched you at Barnes in the ICU walk around the hospital. I watched you. I watched you. He said, my, my wife, she, she died there. She was on ECMO just like you. And she passed away and she died. He began sobbing. And we had a moment to converse there because the Lord wanted him ministered to. I made it, but his wife passed away. And he needed to hear that God loves you. God has a plan for you. Don't you give up. There was some, some other things that we discussed. And I said, you know what? Don't, don't give up. God is faithful. God can heal you. He can heal your family. He told me about some family situations. I said, God can heal that. We need to be sensitive to the moving of God's spirit. It's crazy how God places us in those, the right place at the right time, just like Esther. It may not be as big as like it's saving an entire race of people, but affecting one life, even one life. You never know till you get to heaven what that will do. I'm going to have everybody stand, and I'm going to close now. You know, I want to say this, because as I'm studying this lesson, I thought of Brother Burner too. It's important for the church, because before I went through my whole mess with stuff, and I refer to that a lot because it was so life-changing for me. It changed, it, uh, it completely changed me. Oh, thank God for those trials. Thank God for those trials. It changed me. It, oh, it accelerated so much growth. Brother Burner had spoke to me before this all happened, and he said, the Lord spoke to me, and it was in service, just like we're here today. The Lord spoke to me, and the Lord told me to tell you, the things that cost you the most will be your greatest rewards. I needed to hear those words. I still, I still hold on to those words. It's, it's important. It's important because when you're in the house of God and you're part of the church, we strengthen and we help each other through the spirit of God. God is so good to build character and integrity in us, to make us worth something great. 
full of faith and love and strong and beautiful in him as we become transformed into his likeness. And we come forth in the end as gold. Is gold. Not saying, well, God should have never allowed this. But we've got to trust God. We've got to trust his way, his process, and to know that he really does have my best interest at heart. I may not see it now, but he does. I'm going to stand on the word, and I'm going to trust him, and I cannot be moved. If I fall, I'm going to get back up in the name of Jesus. We're going to pray. Lord, I thank you for your truth. I thank you for the infilling of your spirit. I thank you for your blood that was shed on Calvary. I thank you for your church and the privilege of being part of the church, the body of Christ. Bind your church together in unity and love. Bind our families together in unity and love. I speak the blessings of God upon the church in Jesus' name. Help us to realize who we are in you, our purpose. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So we'll give you a few minutes to um, greet one another, and we're going to be starting service here in about 12 minutes or so. God bless you all.